Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Coming in this morning, I was trying to think now, what, since, since our friends on the radical side of the pol political scale um, have tried to rename everything, I was trying to figure out, now, what kind of term would they come up with for today? So I was, I was thinking about it. So, I'll, so perhaps this is um, Joyous Testosterone Rich Estrogen Deprived Progenitors Day. <laughs> or, or perhaps it would be XY Chromosome Begetters Day. Yeah. Ooh, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Although they probably wouldn't use beget because it's in the Bible. No, that could be Mother's Day. Yeah, but you know, okay. so I, I mean, you're probably correct, but there's too many variables in there. Okay. You're to ask permission for well, yeah. So we're going to stick with the biblical kind of ideology, and happy Father's Day to you all. And fortunately, one of the nice things when we come to celebrate is it really doesn't matter whether your father was not the optimum uh, model for being a father or not, because we do have an adopted dad that is the model for us all. And so that is our heavenly father that we can re generally celebrate, genuinely celebrate. And because we are adopted, we have all of the benefits of adoption. So we're going to kick off with, this is my father's world. Let's open our Bibles to Psalm 103. I love the Psalms, right? Aren't they great? Who here wakes up and reads some Psalms? Right. Don't they make you feel good? I mean, even, even the imprecatory Psalms. You know, you're like, okay, I can kind of see why this person wrote that. If you don't know the imprecatory songs, are the retributory Psalms, the ones where they're a little like take care of my enemy type things. <laughs> There's a few in there. <laughs> what Psalm 103 I'm going to, our primary verse is verse 13, but I'm going to start at verse 8. It says, the Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He will not always chide, scold, or rebuke, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. As for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. The, the term, the patria or the patriarchal term, whenever you see the all caps, Lord, you can put Father in there. Think Father. And even go a little further, think my Father, my heavenly Father. And this is a huge paradigm shift in the way of thinking. Now in the Old Testament, and I'll have a couple of references here, it was still always about relationship. But because the law was in place and its purpose was standing for, uh, uh, to, to, to get the people to understand how holy God is and set up the pattern of grace that God showed in the Old Testament, moving into the New Testament, fulfilled in Christ, people had a distance to God. I mean, they didn't even say his name. They don't even say his name today. And a scribe would be sitting there, and if he had to do the name of God, he would clean himself, get a new pen, new ink, write it, stop, go cleanse himself again, and get a new pen and a new a quill and the ink, and start and continue. I had a big, big deal. Um, the thing is, on the day of Yom Kippur, now think of it this way. I, I'm a Jewish person. You're a Jewish person. We're usually in one of the outer courts. Even the men. So the women are the further out. The men are in the inner court. And then there's the tabernacle. The holy of holies. There's this. Aww. We're told in Leviticus. In the holy of holies. God says I will appear on Yom Kippur. In your presence. He says that it will appear as a mist, as a cloud, before the one giving the sacrifice. Right? That veil is there. 
because only someone who has purified himself can be in there. Now, you spend your whole life as a priest. Had to be in the priestly line. You had to live a pious life. You had to wait and serve and serve. And at one point, it's possible that just maybe after a life of service, if you're lucky and your name is drawn, you might one time, one time only, get to go through that veil. And even then, great fear that you weren't pure enough. You hadn't sanctified yourself enough. If you showed up falsely, the penalty was death. And you got to go in there and put the blood over the mercy seat. You see the symbolism? The blood over the mercy seat. And the Lord says he would appear and it was a sacrifice for the people and he'd come out and the people would rejoice. Ah, we have been cleansed. A very, very big deal. And many of them thought, it's this relationship that's so far away. But it never was. Throughout the Old Testament, there was always a closeness. Abraham, Isaac, Noah, Moses, Joseph. I'm only naming a few. A closeness. It was a relationship. With Abraham, he was righteous because of his faith, not because of his works. Right? Noah was a righteous man in his generation. His heart was right before the Lord. Every action he did was not perfect, but his heart was right. Joseph was seen as a, an example of the Messiah to come in so many ways, but he wasn't perfect. David, <laughs> David, over and over again says, thank you for removing my transgressions. He doesn't say it's because I, I, I upheld the law perfectly, Lord, that you removed my transgressions. He just says, thank you for doing it in your great mercy. I trust and know that you can and you will. But the mentality was this, this distance. The, the ones who are holy and pious who have access to God and we the people. And then Jesus shows up on the scene. You've got Jesus showing up. And, and suddenly, he's just turning everything on its head, right? Jesus is turning things around. In Matthew 5, if you just start with the Beatitudes. Matthew 5, I'm going to start with verse 3. Blessed are the ones who are allowed to go into the temple. The ones who wear the fine robes. The ones who you step away from when they walk down the street. No! Blessed are the... Poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit in the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they are the ones who shall receive mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And the peacemakers shall be called children of God. We are called children of our Father. We are said that we are adopted. In, we are now co-heirs. We have inherited all that the Father has. It's, it's staggering. I, I know none of us can get our mind around it. But we've been given that signet ring. We, we, we were the prodigal. Our Father standing in the highest precipice looking for us and then running to us when he saw us coming home. Saying, all that I have is yours. And I forgive you and I love you. And it's time to kill that fatted calf. But let's go back to that Holy of Holies scenario. Ah. <sighs> In Hebrews 4, it says, Hebrews 4.14, Since we have a, a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, suddenly we get out of the spiritual, I mean out of the earthly, and we get into the spiritual. 
It's talking about Jesus Christ who not only lived this corporeal life perfectly, but conquered sin and death. He now is our great high priest. He has taken over. He is of the line, the Melchizedekian line, our great high priest, right? And he, um, he says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then with confidence, 4.16 of Hebrews, draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace and help in the time of need. Now, this is that picture of the veil being torn when the blood of Christ and it was finished and the veil was torn. Access to that place that was so holy, everybody had to stand far off. And you hoped if you were even in the class that could get there, maybe your number was called. All of a sudden, it's open. The Father says, now, this relationship, this one-on-one -on -one has been restored. Your great high priest, not of the Levitical or the Aaronic priesthood, but of the perfect holy priesthood, the line of Melchizedek. He's our great high priest. And there's a, 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 if you go to Matthew 6, verse 6, there's, there's Jesus used to, it, it talks about Jesus going away in the morning and he'd have his time with his father. He'd go and he'd, he'd pray. And I, I think sometimes we don't consider what a great example that is. And we're, uh, we're going to get back to prayer right at the end. But it's so important for us as we are not only being men who are the heads of our households and women. This, this includes you. When our children watch both of us. Not only studying the word of God. Not only praying to the Lord. Privately. And publicly, they're watching. Our children watch us. In, in Matthew 6, 6, it says, but, when, but you, whenever you pray, this is Jesus speaking, enter into your room or enter into your closet, enter into your private place where you're not disturbed by the world. And you have shut your door. Pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. <laughs> Suddenly, fathers and mothers and children and all who believe get to go right into the presence of our Lord. And we get to teach that to others, especially our children. Look what the Lord has done. Look how he has blessed us. We have such a close relationship that we get to go into his presence. In number six, we, we, we give this as a benediction. But just listen. I'm, I'm going to change the word Lord to the word Father. Number 624, the, your Father bless you and keep you. Your Father make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And your Father turn his face towards you and give you peace. He says, Come. I want to bless you. I want to give you peace. I want to shine my face upon you. Now, we're talking about our perfect and holy Father. That's number 6, 24 to 26, if that's what you're looking for. Numbers. Number 6. Sorry, number 6. And you can see in the Old Testament, he was all about blessing. It wasn't about keeping the law. It was always about blessing. Hmm. So let's, if you're, if, if you're near Psalms, if you didn't go to Numbers, go back to Psalm 103. We're going to go through a few points here about a father on earth emulating our father in heaven. And Psalm 103, verse 12, we all know this. We all love it. We've all quoted it. As far as the east is to the west, the Lord has forgiven me my transgressions. Who here has quoted that before? I know you have. And you think about it. It's a promise of God. I have as far as east is to west, meaning they, the never the twain shall meet, just east is to west. I've forgotten your sins, right? You know, 
forgiving and forgetting. You know, there's a, the old saying, whenever my wife gets mad at me, she gets historical. And, the, and, and she's, he's, this gentleman is telling this to his friend. And he said, you mean she gets hysterical? And he goes, no, no, no. No, my wife doesn't get hyster- hysterical. She gets historical. She brings up everything wrong I've ever done. <laughs> well, that's, that's not going to help with forgiveness. All right? Think about, the Lord actually says, if he brought up everything and held it against us, <laughs> the psalmist says, who could stand? If the Lord remembered all your transgressions and held them against you, your life would be worthless. But he doesn't. He doesn't hold them against you. He knows that we are weak. He knows that we are frail. He knows that we struggle. And he says, I will give you strength. I will lift you up. But first and foremost, I will forgive you. Walk in my steps. Let me lead and direct your path. And Isaiah 57, I'm just going to, I'm going to kind of say it the way it, it, it's in <laughs> exclamation points. Isaiah 57, 14, God says, rebuild the road, clear away the rocks and stones so my people can return, God bless, from captivity. Think about God saying that. Clear everything out. My people are coming home. And it continues in 57, 15. The high and the lofty ones who live in eternity, the holy one says this, I live in the high and holy place with those whose spirits are contrite and humble. I restore the crushed spirit of the humble and revive the, the courage of those with repentant hearts. God is saying, You who have humbled yourself before me, you who have an understanding of who I am, you who have accepted me for my grace and my mercy and put me in primacy in your life and fear me, the love and admonition of the Lord comes from an understanding. And this fear isn't that he's going to beat us down all the time. It's a fear of saying, I know who you are and I give you all respect and reverence in your position in my life. Nothing else comes first. Now, fathers... All of us, pastors, all of us. Is that true in our life every day? Is that true in your life every day? Lord, you are first. You are foremost. I trust in you completely for you will direct my path, be a light to my path, clear the road, bring the mountains down if they are an obstacle to me, and you will move me forward as I am in your will. Your grace is upon me with my contrite heart before the king of kings and the lord of lords who i call father who i call abba which is daddy father i can cry out to you and you hear me for i fear you meaning i know whom i serve I know who he is. I know his power and his might and his mercy and his grace in my life. Do your children know that about you? Oh, ouch. Bring it back to the practical. God is still firm. God rebukes if necessary. But boy, does he love. Boy, does he love us even in our discipline. As parents, as husbands, do we love our wives properly? Do we love our wives as Christ loves the church? Do we let our wives know what they mean to us? How we respect them? How we cherish them? Their thoughts, their ideas, their eccentricities? I mean, think about ours. Think what they have to put up to to deal with us. Do we? 
if we truly reflected on who we are and how much we've been forgiven and how much grace God has given to us and he keeps building us up and blessing us and moving us forward for him and yet sometimes we don't have compassion on our wife or our children? Ouch! I'm not talking about proper discipline. I'm talking about it being overshadowed, covered, in grace and love and forgiveness because that's what's been given us. This is practical in our life. Those who are forgiven much love much. We understand what it means to have that grace that only comes from the Lord. And that means being forgetful. There's a, a Christian, a story about a Christian lady. And uh, an, another lady asked her, well, does the devil ever trouble you about your past? Ever come knocking on your door and say, hey, do you remember this? Do you remember that? And she, this Christian lady said, an elderly, elderly Christian lady who'd been through a walk for many years said, I just tell the devil to go east. Well, what if he ever comes back? Well, I tell him, go west. Just keep going. Just keep going. My sins are at the end. Go, go look for them there. Go see if you can find them there. Sometimes it's hard for us to give forgiveness the way God has forgiven. It's very hard for us. It's even harder for us to have that agape, that unconditional, altruistic, all-giving, all-caring, all-blessing love that only truly comes from our Heavenly Father. Although we have it for our children. We love them no matter what. But sometimes the display isn't there. Isn't it amazing that even in our discipline by our Heavenly Father, He's loving us completely. And if we stop and get past the fact that we're being disciplined, we feel it. Do you ever think or notice, let me say this, do you ever notice when you're truly stressed, you're truly stressed and there is an obstacle right back to clear away the mountains, clear the path, clear the road, and there's an obstacle in your life that you feel is uns- insurmountable, you're never closer to the Lord. You're talking to God all the time. Lord, I don't know. I can't handle this. I can't handle this without you. I need you. I need you. Oh, Lord, I need you. Oh, please, give me strength. I am struggling. Oh, good. Glad to see you spending more time with me. Glad to see you're growing and understanding that we have a relationship. All parents have been through the fact that, you know, sometimes, often, you get closer to your child after a time of difficulty. When they've tested you or you've tested them. You know, we're, we're told as, as fathers not to provoke our children. <laughs> we are told that we are to properly shepherd them, properly rebuke them, properly reprove them, and properly grow them, teach them, move them forward. And our example always comes back over and over again to the Lord. There's, uh, I found this little tidbit from Matthew, a, a reference to perfect love. I'll say it that way. Slow to suspect quick to trust, slow to condemn, quick to justify, slow to offend, quick to defend, slow to expose, quick to shield, slow to reprimand, quick to forbear, slow to belittle, quick to appreciate, slow to demand, quick to give, slow to provoke, quick to soothe, slow to hinder, quick to help, slow to resent, quick to forgive. 
I like the fact that it's slow on the things that are negative and fast and quick on the things that are positive, the things that build up, the things that help out. How many times, even when your children are angry at you, are they just wanting you not only to understand their feelings, but to love them and give them direction? Even when they're in a defiance to you. You know, when we get mad at God, <laughs> most of the time, it, it's because we want better understanding on God's will. Why something is happening. Lord, why? There was a lady when I lived in England, and, and her husband was the pastor. And she was a wonderful lady, a little eccentric, artistic. She's always making things. And she would go through bouts by her own mission of anger with the Lord. She said, I'm the last few days, the Lord and I have had it out. And he's winning again. But she would freely admit it. I'm having these struggles and we're having it out. She said, I know. He knows, how, he knows my frame. He knows how I am. And I'm letting him teach me. Different approach than I would have. <laughs> But she came out stronger. She came out more submissive. She was never disrespectful in her anger. But she used that to, to let the father teach her. Some of her children are like that. Some just want to hear and they learn. Some come out and it comes out in anger instead of submission. But they're desiring the same thing. They're desiring... The Father to show them the way. To teach them in the way that they should go so they will walk in it. Because love isn't easy always. We're told that in Psalm 103 again that he's merciful in his steadfast love. You know, as a parent, as a husband, as a wife, we have to have a steadfast love. A persevering love through the ups, through the downs. Think if God said, yep, I love you when you're, you're at this level of obedience, but I don't love you when you're not. Good thing, I think sometimes it might be the opposite. God says, I love you so much, I'm going to discipline you because I need you back on track. Let me show you how much I love you. You know, a good parent disciplines their child. We get that from our father. A good parent says, I must discipline you because I love you and I need to help you see the error of your ways. All of us have experienced that with our Heavenly Father and we've done it with our children. What an example. And you go through these periods of time where you're learning and you're growing. So there's a, <laughs> a story so Moses is up on the hill, and he gets these tablets. Perhaps you've heard of them. And he comes down, and the people have made a calf. And Moses is angry. God is angry. And he takes those, and he throws them down. You know, and the ark is the second set of tablets, not the first set. He goes back. And he said, destroy them all. <laughs> Just forget it. The uh, living uh, translation says, um, <clears throat> Mo, I'm going to nuke these party animals. Mo, uh, Mo, Moses pleads for his people. God says, fine, why don't you hewn some rocks and I'll write on them again. We're going to do this again. We're going to try again. And the whole story comes down to God saying, I am merciful. At the same time, it says another thing. He hears our pleas. He allows us to come before him with pleas. God never was going to destroy them. They were his chosen people for a purpose. He just wanted to grow Moses up in the strength of their relationship, saying, I want to teach you to plead for the people I have put under you, to strive as their leader to direct them before me. 
And he goes down with this second set of the Ten Commandments. Now, was there punishment? Yes. Did God's wrath come down on some of them? Yes. Did Moses grow? Did the people grow in their strength and their walk with the Lord? Yes. Did Moses understand, just as Abraham had, that he could plead with the Lord and the Lord was willing to listen? God uses situations to help us. Situations as parents under our households happen. And God's like, hey, this is an opportunity. Don't look at it as something else, but an opportunity to help this person find me, grow with me, and I will use you as the head of the household to lead this charge. Come to me, plead with me, pray to me, and we'll work together for the direction that you need to lead your house. God's grace is so powerful. And back to the idea of prayer, as a parent, there's something we have to do. We have to be present. As a husband, as a wife, we have to be available. We have to be volitional and intentional with our time. And we have to be able to judge a situation spiritually. I've told this story several times about, you know, you shall not judge. That's not correct. There's a context with that. 2 Corinthians 2.15 says that a spiritual man judges all things. A spiritual father judges all things. How do we judge things? Through the wisdom of our spiritual father. So a spiritual man in the house who is walking with his spiritual father has discernment and he judges. And by that he is fair in his assessment of a situation. Psalm 103.13 says, A father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. So as you're intentional with the time, intentional with your actions, you need to make sure that you share your life. I think this is a problem in many households. They're living two lives. You need to be able to share who you are with your house just as you are to share with your heavenly Father. Listen to your Father who gave you life. Do not despise your mother when she's old, Proverbs 23. Psalm 139, you all know this one. We're fearfully, we're wonderfully made. God designed us for a purpose and he gave us our families for a purpose. So fathers, remember who you are before the Lord. So I want to end up here reading some lyrics to a song. If we as fathers and mothers and heads of our house to our children put our heavenly father first, what's going to happen? They're going to watch us when we pray. They're going to watch us when we love. They're going to watch us when we discipline. Deuteronomy 6 says, These words which I'm commanding you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your sons And you shall talk to them when you sit in your house. Our example is given by our Father. Have Bible study in your home. Pray with your children. Share with your children. Share with your wives. Grow together in the Lord. There's a song I'm I'm going to give you the lyrics to. Many of you know it. Jesus said, be an imitator. Or Paul said, Imitate me as I imitate Christ. We're actually told we're conforming to the image of our Savior. This song is a song called I've Been Watching You by Rodney Atkins. Some of you probably know it. And it says, Driving through town, just my boy and me, with a Happy Meal in his booster seat, knowing that he wouldn't have the toy till his nuggets were gone. At a green traffic light turned straight to red, I hit my brakes and mumbled under my breath. As fries went flying and his orange drink covered his lap, well, then my four-year-old said a four-letter word that started with S, and I was concerned. So I said, son, now where did you learn to talk like that? He said, I've been watching you, Dad. Ain't that cool? 
I'm your buckaroo. I want to be like you. And eat all my food and grow as tall as you are. We got cowboy boots and camel camel pants. Yeah, we're just alike. Hey, ain't we, Dad? I want to do everything you do, so I've been watching you. (laughs) Who here has, uh, even as a pastor, said something, (coughs) right? Uh, Before I finish this song, I have to tell you, my little niece was driving this fake little car in the house, and she ran into the couch. (laughs) And she said a word. (laughs) And I said, what? What? She goes, that's what, Brett, my, your, that's what my father says when he has to slam on his brakes in traffic. <laughs> Continues. <laughs> we got home and I went to the barn. I bowed my head and I prayed real hard. I said, Lord, please help me. Help my stupid self. Then, uh, then this side of bedtime later that night, turning on my son's Scooby-Doo la- nightlight, he crawled out of bed and he got down on his knees. He closed his little eyes. He folded his little hands. And he spoke to God like he was talking to a friend. And I said, son, now where did you learn to pray like that? And he said, I've been watching you, dad. Ain't that cool? I'm your buckaroo. I want to be like you. Eat all my food and grow as tall as you are. We like fixing things and holding mama's hand. Yeah, we just alike, ain't we, Dad? I want to do everything you do, so I've been watching you. My tears filled my eyes. I wrapped them in a hug. Said, my little bear is growing up. He said, but when I'm big, I still know what I want to do because I've been watching you, Dad. Ain't that cool? It's a really good song. (laughs) And that's the position we've been given by God. Fathers, you're the head of your household. You're the patriarchs of your home. The covering is how you treat your wife, how you treat your children, and how they watch you lead in the spirit of your heavenly Father as he has taught you and given you every instruction on how you are to lead that house. I can't think of a more important job. There is none. Be intentional with your time with your family. Be intentional with your time with the Lord. Be in prayer with the Father and let your children see it. Let them see you go to church. Let them see you in the Word. Let them see how you are doing everything you can to obey your Heavenly Father. That's the practical application. It's every second of every day of our lives. There's never a time when it doesn't apply. It applies always. And it is not a burden. It is a joy to know that we have the greatest example in our Father of who we can be for our families. Let's pray. Father God. Your gifts are amazing. Your blessings beyond measure. Let us allow your influence in our lives to consume us. Let us truly seek to walk in your light and in your path and let it influence the people you've given us to shepherd, starting in the home, starting with our family. Let them say, I want to be like you, Dad, as we're saying, Father, I want to be like you. Thank you for that opportunity to be that in this world. (laughs) And give us the knowledge, discernment, strength, and fortitude to do it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.